All right, so welcome everyone and thank you so much for joining us for tonight's Visiting Scholar Talk. Um, this event is part of a series of events sponsored by the Division of Arts and Letters and the Center for Student Engagement and Intercultural Programs at Governor's State University. I'm Rebecca Seifert, Assistant Professor of Art History here at GSU, and this is the inaugural Memorial Lecture honoring Dr. Arthur Bourgeois, the late Professor Emeritus in Art History at Governor's State University. Um, a little bit about Dr. Bourgeois, in case you didn't know him, he um, received his PhD in Art History with an emphasis on African, Pre-Columbian, and Oceanic Art from Indiana Uni University. Dr. Bourgeois taught at Governor's State then from 1977 to 2012, and in his courses on African, Native American, pre-Columbian, Oceanic, and Asian art, he helped students better understand how art is viewed within context as a cultural matrix of ceremony, religion, and mythic narrative. He was also generous enough to donate hundreds of African and pre-Hispanic objects, which we have begun cataloging online now, um, thanks to the help of some former students, Victoria Stroll and Mike Parrott. Now I'd like to introduce tonight's guest speaker, zooming in all the way from Costa Rica, Dr. Lauren Bonilla Merchav. Doctor in art history with national and international experience, Lauren is a lecturer, researcher, curator, and consultant of art, culture, museums, and heritage. Currently, she is adjunct professor of art history in the School of Plastic Arts at the University of Costa Rica. She also teaches humanities and tourism courses at the National University of Costa Rica. She has published on modern and contemporary Costa Rican art, as well as on topics of museology. Lauren is an active member of ICOM, the International Council of Museums. Currently, she is treasurer of the National Committee of ICOM Costa Rica, having served as chair from 2013 to 2019, as well as the treasurer of the Regional Alliance for Latin America and the Caribbean ICOM LAC. She currently co-chairs the ICOM Standing Committee for the Museum Definition, which is undertaking a participatory process of consultation at a global scale to reach a proposal for a new museum definition. This proposal will be voted on in August of this year and seeks to update the current definition to more adequately reflect museum practice today. So Lauren, welcome. Uh, you can go ahead and start sharing your screen whenever you're ready. And in the meantime, if anyone wants to um, and I think I can uh, speak on your behalf, Lauren. If you wanna pose a question in the chat box, feel free to, and we will keep our eye on that. Wonderful, thank you so much, Rebecca. Thank you so much for the invitation. This was a really um, fun opportunity for me to be thinking about how I wanted to uh, present uh, today's topic and also um, speak in the name and honoring uh, a colleague who spent so much of his time uh, studying and collecting uh, pre-Hispanic art, as well as art from other regions of the world. Um, so as I was thinking about it, um, I was also interested in kind of looking at pre-Hispanic art, but through a lens that may speak more um, uh, aptly to where we are right now in the world. Um, we're at a moment in time where it's very, um, oops, sorry, it's very, it's it's very, it's imperative that we make major changes in the way that um, our societies coexist on this planet. Um, so, with that said, the objective of today is to give you guys an introduction to pre-Hispanic art of Mesoamerica. Um, we will talk about what Mesoamerica is and. It's basically just a handful of examples from art of that region, of the Mesoamerican region. Um, but as we do it, I also want to take advantage of, of, of being able to start decolonizing our vision or, or doing practices or approaching what we're looking at um, through this notion of decolonizing. So just I could lecture on about what decolonization is, but I actually made a brief um, activity to engage you all. Um, and I think in, in, in itself, the activity will help us completely understand what decolonization is about. So uh, Rebecca is gonna help me out to try to tally the responses. I'd really appreciate if you guys answered uh, the questions, preferably in the chat box. Um, I'd love it if you all, took, uh, all participated and um, you'll see they're very simple questions. So. The first question, are you of native descent or do you know someone of, of native descent? So that would be a yes or no answer. 
are you native or do you know somebody who is Native American or has some Native American descent? And when I speak of Native American, I also, it can be somebody from any Native American in all of the Americas, not just the United States. Okay, so we're a small group, but let's see. Rebecca, you answer. You have to answer as well. I said yes, but then I clarified. I know someone who- Hi, Rebecca. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. sorry. <laughs> One, two, three, you did answer, sorry. Um, okay, so it's half and half. So 50% of you either are or know someone who is of native descent. Um, if we include myself in this group, I definitely know a ton of people who are of native descent being here in Costa Rica. So that would make, half of us or more than half of us that know somebody of native descent. Okay, next question. How much would you say you know about Native American or indigenous history and or culture? Nothing, a bit, a decent amount or expert? Okay, I think what we've got is one, nothing, three, a bit, one, a decent amount, and no experts. Okay, great. And then, I'm gonna say that Tatiana's answer is a bit, right? I only know what's been taught in school, so let's say a bit. Mm -hmm. So now, now it's the next question. How much would you say you know about European history and culture? Nothing, a bit, a decent amount, expert. Now, Rebecca, we're gonna count you as an expert. I was gonna say, I feel like I'm an expert in the art history of European. <laughs> That's good enough. <laughs> okay. That is. Okay, so we're starting from Stacy Amadeo's response, which is a bit. And then we have three people saying a decent amount and Tatiana saying a bit. And then we have, of course, our professor here who we can count as expert and Hannah Mobley between decent and expert probably. Mm -hmm. So I think this speaks volumes in relation to where you guys are, well, actually, I don't know where in the world you are. Nowadays, we can be anywhere. <laughs> I'm in Costa Rica. Um, but it, considering okay. you're on campus or near campus or somewhere in the vicinity, um, how crazy is it that we know so little about the history and culture of the place where we're from, and yet we know so much of a place that's far away? Um, of course, that's a massively huge question, but I want to just have it in the backdrop um, of your thoughts and also introduce a quote um, from a text that's really brand new. It was published in February and I read about it and I got it. Um, and it's great so far, it's genetics, but it's about the histories and the origins of, of humans on the continent. And she says this, she cites this quote, European colonists, this is in relation to the fact, sorry, let me backdrop one second, in relation to the, to, um, the fact that most narratives and histories of, of, of um, indigenous cultures are um, oral. And that manner of oral history was simply not considered by the Europeans when they arrived on this continent to be of equal status. And so they just discarded it and created a whole other framework. So those are the frameworks that we're gonna be talking about here in this, in this quote. European colonists did not view these traditions as equivalent to their own histories. In these frameworks, native peoples are marginalized or forgotten, excluded from public conversations and portrayed as inhabitants of the past rather than contemporary members of society. All of you, not all of you, but many of you said that you knew somebody, if not yourselves, had some sort of indigenous heritage. Um, you're perfectly part of our contemporary society. 
their own knowledge too often is ignored by non-native scholars. This ultimately contributes to the erasure and marginalization of indigenous peoples in society at large. Um, I think that that's key in understanding that it's just an, it's, it's basically an injustice that was done. The process of colonization has us mainly thinking about other histories than about the history that is local because since it, from the outset, the local history and the local culture were considered of less value. Um, and so my idea today is simply to introduce you guys to um, culture and history from the Mesoamerican region um, and hopefully just excite you about it and hopefully open you up to a sense of how it's not something so exotic and strange and it's actually a really um, important, the lessons that can be learned are majorly important. Um, okay, so just quickly uh, to begin in terms of the peopling of the Americas, um, there is still ongoing debate as to when human beings came to the Americas. Um, but what is characteristic of early American civilizations, no matter where they are in the American continent, is that they had no contact once they got here with external other continents. So they were kind of, you know, they came here and then they were stuck here. Unlike the European, African, Asian continent that had was continuously, you know, circulating culture, cultural practices. Um, so that in the one hand to keep that in mind, how fascinating is that? And then, um, it's also, as I mentioned before, uncertain when human beings arrived, um, but we definitely think that there's, every day there's more evidence that points to an arrival as early as 20 or 30,000 years ago. When I was a kid, we kind of learned that it was, you know, that humans came to the Americas like around 5,000 years ago, maybe, maybe a little bit more. Um, that got pushed up to 11. So like by the time I was in high school, it, it was more people knew about maybe they were around for longer. Um, and that's with the Clovis culture. Um, so what we're looking at here, it was called the Clovis culture from the town of Clovis, um, where they found a great amount of these spearheads. And the spearheads were really important because they were found also embedded between the ribs of animals. So that's how it was proof that, the, that there weren't two, that it wasn't two different um, prehistoric objects that happened to be in a similar burial ground. Um, it was specifically some, an action that took place. And that was exciting to counteract all of these crazy nonsense theories that had circulated, especially, um, uh, throughout the colonial period about how the uh, the Native Americans were descendants of Adam and Eve and like it was very problematic that the Bible didn't speak about indigenous populations and so this whole issue led to these kind of notions that well they weren't that long ago and they weren't you know, around for that long, but we've been finding more and more of these spearheads spread throughout the North American continent um, that are in this specific shape. And what's really interesting is this Clovis spear shape, spearhead shape um, is only in the Americas. Uh, you don't see it in Asia. So in terms of, of um, genetic type typologies, we do know that we're entirely linked to the haplogroups of uh, East Asia, Siberia and East Asia. So all of the indigenous communities um, are from East Asia. They're not European by any means and they're not African either, which is gonna be interesting when we look at one of the objects. Um, and this, you know, the, the, the design of this spearhead that we're able to date to about 11,000 before the common era, um, is spread throughout and it's so sophisticated and so advanced. If you notice, um, it's, it's really, really, really thin blade. To be able to, to continuously create this design implies, um, without breaking this stone, um, implies a civilization that has been growing already with time, that has been able to perfect um, the, the, the design of this, of this spearhead, right? So that's what also, makes us think that even though there's a Clovis first 
theory, like that there's nobody before Clovis, we have more and more evidence that there were, and especially, and very interestingly, we have the earliest dated is about 14,000 years ago um, to about uh, um, 12,000, no, it, it about 14,000 before the common era. So it'd be about 15,000 years ago, um, findings in Chile. So, which is Chile is all the way to the Southern point. So that requires that mankind, humanity, excuse me, humanity would have come down the American continent and made its way all the way to Chile, which would definitely take many generations. Um, so henceforth, 20 to 30,000 years, potentially. Um, I'm gonna jump ahead um, now to talk specifically about Mesoamerica. Um, so most of the Clovis, objects were found in the area of the United States. Sorry that the map is in Spanish. Um, but what you can see here is in the orange is what is considered Mesoamerica. So it's part of Mexico and goes down through um, Central America and hits even a little bit of Costa Rica. So um, it actually should, yeah, this, this is supposedly Costa Rica on the map where I'm at right now. Um, but this is basically Mesoamerica. What are the characteristics that join Mesoamerica? Well, a lot of the, the deities, the certain cultural practices, um, the way that cities are generally or urban spaces are generally set up. So that we can see, um, for example, as early as the Olmec culture. Now the Olmec culture is um, in the area of Mesoamerica. And I thought I had stuck in a map, but I don't. Let me just go back for one second to show you where the Olmecs were. The Olmecs, Olmecs were in this area right here. So like pretty much right in the center of this Mesoamerican region. And it's Mesoamerican because they share, share the characteristics of, of religion. They share many characteristics in terms of style, artistic style. Um, and so, well, we'll be talking about some of that right now. So this is the site of La Venta. La Venta was as the second major city of the Olmec people. The Olmec people were considered um, for many, many years, like the mother culture of Mesoamerica, kind of what I was talking about, the Clovis above in North America, um, they were supposedly the first. We know that that's, they're too sophisticated to have been the first civilization. We just don't have any kind of registry of another civilization that we can catalog as such prior to the Olmecs, but more and more we have evidence that it's, you know, it's, it, they're not the first, first ones. There has to be people behind them. We just don't know that much about it. Um, but anyway, so the Olmecs uh, are living in this center. And what's important to point out here is the construction of these pyramids. And that in this case, the pyramids are still being made of clay and dirt. Um, but we're talking about a massive amount of material, 100,000 cubic meters of material that somebody's got to move. And that requires having a, a big enough population and a strong enough hier hierarchy to create this kind of work force that would need to create this massive mound, because we also have to keep in mind that there are no beasts of burden in the Americas. There's none. In South America, they use alpacas, llamas, and that, which are not very strong and can't carry more than like 80 pounds, um, maybe 100, but definitely human beings cannot go on them, and they can't carry that much weight. And in the Mesoamerican region, uh, sorry, nobody at all, um, and no big and beast to burden at all. So this is all human labor. Um, so this site flourished around 900 to 400 before the common era. Um, and it wasn't the first one. The first major city was San Lorenzo. And it's really interesting to see that it's about a uh, two kilometer radius around this city, urban city center. Um, now the Olmecs were named as such for, um, that was the Nahuatl term for people of rubber. Um, and that is because they found, they have found, so that was the name of Nahuatl, the, the, the Aztecs language, the original Aztec language and you know, the contact cultures called the Olmecs, they didn't know what they were actually called, we don't know what they called themselves, but the term is the people of rubber, and what we have found, archaeologists have found 12, maybe more by this date, um, 12 rubber balls in the area, which enables us to know that they played um, the ball game. So what you're seeing here is actually a ball game court um, from El Tajín, which is a, a much later region of Maya culture, in Veracruz near the Mayan um, area. And um, this is a common cultural practice 
throughout all of Mesoamerica. And it's a game that's in a sense similar to soccer and basketball mixed together, but it has ritual implications, um, religious implications as well. And we're not gonna go into that in depth, but it is a cultural connection between all of, all of the Mesoamerican region. And um, so going back to, to the site um, of La Venta, what we know is that there seems to be about an estimated population of about 18,000 people. That's actually very, very large for that period of time, which is 900 to 400 um, before the common era. Um, and what we're looking at here is the pyramid in the back. And this is the civic and ceremonial center of the town. What's interesting to note as well, and we'll see this, and this is common in all of Mesoamerica, is that there was like a plaza type center um, with, uh, many monuments and oftentimes pyramids. Um, it wasn't where people lived, it's where people congregated. And people congregated outside, um, very different than, for example, congregations in large cathedrals or churches, right? This is not an in, inside ritual, it's an outside ritual. There was on the top of the pyramids, be they of dirt and clay or of um, stone, they would have built erected little structures where only the shamans and maybe the, the highest of the members of, of the hierarchy, the social hierarchy would be up there. But in general, everybody else is celebrating the ritual down here. Um, and they have these massive monuments there, which um, one of them, and, and is this is an example of one of them, they're these huge stone heads they're massive. Um, there's they, we found 17 of these colossal heads that are between a meter and a half and three and a half meters. Um, I realize that maybe not all of you work in meters. Sorry about that. About a meter and a half is um, 150 centimeters is about a five feet, pretty much exactly, because my grandmother was pretty about five feet, she was a short lady, and she probably was about 150 um, centimeters. So the smallest one is about five feet, and then, you know, double it, right? They are massive. And what's really interesting about all of them is that they have very distinctive features, although the style of the, 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 um, uh, of the Olmec face and the characteristics are very Olmec, and we'll see them repeatedly in the subsequent examples that I'm going to show you, they are also very distinctive. So that gives art historians and archeologists the impression that this is likely the example of a cult, um, uh, 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 what we call, um, uh, uh, sorry, I'm thinking in Spanish right now, but where you render homage to a certain person, right? A specific person. So this is most likely a specific person, not necessarily a God. Um, which is, that's also something that's interesting to point out. And we'll, re we'll reason why it's also most likely the representation of a human um, later on with some other subsequent uh, examples of deity figures. But um, what do we see? We see these characteristically chubby lips, um, a face that's stern, but at the same time kind of youthful, um, a wide nose and almond shaped eyes. And each of these figures has a, a distinctive kind of cap on his head. Um, so this is another example of one of these, these colossal heads and you can get a sense kind of how big they are from the figures. Um, the stone comes from uh, the, the Tuxla Mountains, as I mentioned here, which is about 60 kilometers away. It's about 40 miles away from the site. So again, this is a massively huge stone that might weigh up to 20 tons. 20 tons is what a full container that goes on a ship weighs. Um, so like imagine a huge tanker ship container and fill that up and that weighs 20 tons. Um, so they're massive stones. Someone's gotta get them there. How do we get them there? And so that's really quite a, a, a great human feat. Um, so when people want to underestimate the civilizations that came prior to the European contact, um, it doesn't make sense because they were so sophisticated. They managed to do these kinds of things. Plus, um, they had, of course, an entire uh, vision about, um, we, we don't know that much about them. We can consider that the Olmecs are 
for us, as far as our, we're concerned, pretty prehistoric because we have no written documents. There appears some glyphs that have not been um, uh, uh, deciphered yet, so we don't know exactly what they say. Um, but we don't know much because we don't have any written registry. But from what has been studied of them and from the even ranging to the oral culture that was present today among indigenous cultures and what the cosmovision or the world vision is of indigenous populations in the region, um, we know something that's absolutely essential, which is there was a deep connection between um, the religion and nature. Um, so here we're seeing what we've come to call an altar. We don't know if it was an altar. We don't actually know how they use this monumental stone. Um, I think I have it from another angle. You can see it from this angle as well. It's this massive stone. Um, check out the height. We're talking about two meters in height. So one thought is that leaders may have sat above it, like a sort of throne. Another thing is maybe it was used like an altar where sacrifices were put on top. Um, we don't actually know. But what's really interesting is to see the figure of who, the person who seems to be a leader. Note the cap on his head. So if we were to consider that these were different representations of different leaders throughout the history of the site, um, of these sites, then this may just be the same person. He emerges from what appears to be a cave. And let me actually move to the next image where you can see a drawing, a diagram of what is carved here. It might make it a little easier to read. Um, and of course, it's totally acceptable that this is a hard um, visual vocabulary for us to read and decipher because our eyes are not used to them. But the more you look at it, like any language, the more it starts to make sense to you. So in this case, we see the figure of a, of a kind of crouching leader who's holding onto a rope, that, a twisted rope that actually wraps around this entire altar. And he's emerging from this cave. And this cave also becomes the jaws of a jaguar. So if you notice up here, there's these two eyes and this is uh, like a jaguar figure. Um, life was conceived as having come from inside the earth. Um, life comes from the, the, the ground. There was this complete notion of that there was, there's three, um, uh, three, three parallel planes uh, that exist. Of course, the underworld are present the, 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 where we are at. And then of course the celestial and that's all connected by an axis mundi. This is shared by cultures all around the world. Um, and what's interesting is that life comes from the underworld. And it's also very much related to growth. So over here, what you see, these images are like the sprouts of corn. So maize, um, maize is the most important um, agricultural product of the Americas. And um, maize is a really fascinating um, crop because it's one of, it's, I think it's the only crop in the world that requires human interaction with it for it to be able to grow. So unlike pods that pop or uh, fruits that animals eat and then defecate out in the woods, there's no way for the seeds to spread if it's not through um, human interaction with it. And why is that? Because apparently it, maize is a genetically modified from teosinte that's kind of like a grass. So this is something that was also developed by the indigenous populations of the Americas. They created their own source of food, which is linked visually in so many of the works, which is something that I wanna show you, how maize literally sprouts in all of the works that we're looking at. So these, these are little examples of maize. And the leader is in the midst, in the middle of all of this, emerges from this. Something else that's really interesting to point out is um, the stone. The stone is basalt. Basalt was really important, clearly, for the Olmecs because they have a lot of basalt monuments. The Olmec heads are basalt. This is basalt. Um, basalt is a volcanic rock. How do you get volcanic rock? Because it was spouted out from a volcano at some point and became a big rock. It comes from the inside of the earth. So again, all of this seems to make sense as we begin to see kind of the cycle of all of it. Um, I see somebody put something in the chat and I, don't, I wanted to see if it was a question. Oh, okay, just happy. And um, this is something else I wanted to show you that we also believe um, it's called El Principe, sorry that I have this in Spanish. I 
put the wrong, um, I didn't change it to English. Um, this is a representation of somebody else that we can, we assume is a representation of a leader um, because of the hat again, because he has these ear spools that are like these big, probably jade, massive things in his ears. Um, but we see the same facial characteristics, right? The chubby lips, the wide nose, the almond shaped eyes. Um, oftentimes people here, he looks very Asiatic, but in the Olmec heads, you'll notice that um, people always are pointing out that it's actually very African. Um, and so there's all these theories about how there's African descent. There is none. Um, it just, it, it, genetically speaking, they've not found any um, proof of having any African haplogroups within the genetic systems. They're all just from um, coming from East Asia and Siberia, but having developed into their own kinds of haplogroups here in the Americas. So here long enough so that genetically they become their own type of uh, genetic subgroups. Um, so anyways, uh, the thing I wanted to point out the most about this guy is doesn't he look like he's sitting like a big feline? So again, if we think about jaguar, jaguars of image, this is in Mesoamerica and in South America, the jaguar is extremely important figure, figure of power. Um, and, but it also has very much cosmic relations because they speak of the jaguars having the, the spots that are, um, the celestial spots of the stars on his fur. So there's a very cosmic relationship between the jaguar and the ruling powerful forces. Um, so again, just very interesting to see this position. Um, and sometimes I just like to think about our current leaders and wonder how, how we like to see them look. How do we want our current leaders to project themselves? What was the difference between figures like Obama versus figures like Trump in terms of how they projected their visual aura, right? And so it's really interesting just to think about what was wanting to be projected before the eyes of the Olmec people. Um, here's another one of these altars. Uh, another issue that's really interesting, once again, kind of emerging from the earth or from this cave, and in this case, we don't know what he's holding in his hands. Um, is it a sacrificial baby? Is it a, a wear jaguar, which are these kind of objects that we're gonna see now? Is he holding some sort of a ritual object? Um, it's, it's unclear, but once again, I, I just wanted to point out, and when you see the environment behind of La Venta, you see the jungle, right? You just get a sense of how nature is just omnipresent. Um, it, it's, it's palpable and it becomes ever more clear how it is that this is a people that have such a direct relationship with nature. Um, their whole entire vision of the world is in reaction and in seeking balance with the world, with the nature around us. Um, beautiful object, this might be one of the kinds of objects that that previous perhaps leader figure is holding. Um, it's called the Kunz Act based on the name of the, the archeologist who found it, Kunz. And it's an ax because um, it's based on the shape of an agricultural tool. So this is an object that directly relates to um, fertility. Green is a color that's highly prized in Mesoamerica and jade is a highly prized stone within Mesoamerica. Probably this came from Guatemala. Um, so again, something quarried quite far away. And um, it represents fertility by the color, once more, you know, green, the color of life, the color of water as well, because jade itself also kind of transitions into blue. Um, and at the same time, it also represents this deity figure, which is an anthropomorphized axe, which is a tool of agriculture. Right, so it's not a spearhead like what we had seen earlier in class. It's an axe, which would be a tool, but it's obviously a ritual axe because if you see the size of it, it's 30, 31 centimeters, which is about uh, over a foot. A foot, I think, is like, or it's about a foot. So you you wouldn't use a foot long axe head, right? Um, this is, and clearly, you're not going to use jade <laughs> to uh, be hacking at the dirt, but it is an object. Um, that in that way relates to agriculture. But again, we don't know exactly what it represents, but we notice similar characteristics as the leader figure who has the almond eyes, the widespread uh, nose, this 
um, a, a, the upturned lip. And we notice also for those of you who might be actually artists or know about artistry, it's really interesting what happens with the Olmecs. Um, in this case, you can see the deep, they used a drill, right? So that's very important for us to know. Um, and how they maintain or retain the drill marks rather than try to erase them. Um, this is something that's, it's just interesting to point out um, it's part of the aesthetic that's developed. Anthropomorphized objects and animals tend to be the ones that we assume are representing deities or, or kind of objects that, yeah, that represent deities rather than the, the very realistic, although with few stylized components of the massive Olmec head, right? The Olmec head is actually super naturalistic. Um, but it had then certain elements that are stylized, like the almond-shaped eyes that are kind of very drawn in. In this case, we see, again, this kind of seeking of naturalism with the volumes and the polish on, it feels very skin-like, be it in basalt or in jade. Um, let me see if I brought the extra example. Um, no. um, but anyways, we see, we see this interest and this need to understand uh, nature and the, the importance of nature and the importance of, of our rituals to nature. Um, another example briefly, I'm just gonna show you, it's a, cell, a small figure that has a sprouting um, a maize plant. So maize is everywhere. Uh, this is another thing that it might not relate entirely to um, this topic of nature within uh, pre-Hispanic cultures, but it's just so fascinating that I couldn't not show it to you guys. These are 17 little Figures. Well, then currently there's 16. I guess one of them must have gotten lost along the way, but it current, they were originally 17 figures um, and six celts uh, that were buried in place like this. So they actually, like a little scenario, you know, this is, we don't know what it is. We have no idea, but we know it was super special and important, whatever it intended to document, if it was a documentation of a, of a ceremony, um, if it was supposed to represent how, you know, uh, the, the, the parliament of these people, we have no idea what exactly it represented. But how do we know that it was probably very special? Because it was buried in a specific way. Um, so there was, sorry, there was uh, white sand, very, very cleaned, processed white sand right around it, holding the configuration in place as such. And then um, very special sand, like cleaned out sand, they built a mound on top of it. And then they put a monument on top of that. Um, and there is also evidence of them having redug the hole a hundred years later. In a sense, it's almost as if like to check that they were still there, these little figures. Again, we don't know what they represent, but they're um, different materials. There's one made of granite, two made of jade, and 13 made of serpentine, which is another kind of green stone. These are a few of them. You can see them closer up. The figure right here, this is the one of basalt, and the figure right here, she's the only female figure, which is really interesting. Um, so here, you can't tell so much that she's female, although she has um, her breasts perhaps more demarcated. But if you notice, if we go back to this one, oops, sorry, um, I have to move this. you notice her posture seems to be a little bit different. And you notice that the, the protuberances are a little bit clearer. This is the fe female figure. So again, that, that, that I mean, is it representing an important wedding of sorts? We don't know, but uh, nonetheless, it's super interesting to conjecture. And um, just to show you that cranial deformation was a practice um, throughout Mesoamerica, and we see it represented here, but these are actually skulls that I wanted you guys to take note that this is something that happened. Uh, another example, I should have put this one before, but just again, to see the naturalism and the, the mix of naturalism with stylization here, uh, it's really interesting, but it also, once more, jade is a super hard stone to work it and to achieve this degree of, of both naturalism and polish is not easy at all, right? So it's really quite um, uh, a society, a civilization that was able to have artists who just spent their time doing this and not worrying about food. Somebody else is worried about the food. Somebody else is worried about that. You know, very specialized uh, society already. Um, Lauren, can I interject for a second? Yeah, please. Um, there were a couple of questions in the chat box. Everybody's um, very curious about the previous... Yeah. 
figures. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Super interesting. Super yeah. interesting. So we were wondering, um, Victoria said, love these. Is this the only one? Only one. Yes. The only one that we know that's been found. Doesn't mean it's the only one. It's the only one that's been found. Mm -hmm. um, do you know why there's only one female? No idea. Again, we don't have any written. Uh, there's some symbols that might be glyphs that have been identified, but they haven't been uh, deciphered. So we have nothing to go on except conjecture. Um, referring to council configuration. Yeah, I mean, could it be a council and then we have a woman in the council? That would speak really highly. Or is this, um, uh, we know that in the Mayan, uh, Mayan civilization, it was super important um, marriages between different um, City states were really important. So, is this ref, you know, recording a marriage? I would like to think not. I would like to think that she's like, you know, <laughs> just a member of an important member of the tribe, but, um, you know, the, or the council. And again, we don't know what these Celts represent either. Why is there six of them? Um, why are they of different stone as well? What do the different stones mean? We don't have answers but it doesn't impede it from being super cool. <laughs> um, so, uh, sorry, I'm going the wrong direction. Is there any other questions about it or other ideas of what it can be? This is always a huge conversation starter in class for sure. Um, so I'm glad that it piqued your interest as well. You guys can Google it and see what more recent have, um, findings have come up. Um, they also worked in ceramics. So I wanted to show you some of the different materials that are worked in because many of these are gonna be the same materials worked in by all of the different uh, Mesoamerican cultures. Referring to the council, what is the name of it again? Of what, of the Olmecs? The people, this is the, the culture of the Olmecs. Um, oh, offering number four. Yeah, offering number four from La Venta, La Venta. Um, so they worked ceramic. And again, um, another image that's become very characteristic of the Olmecs when we think of the Olmecs, possibly also because it's at the Metropolitan Museum. So there's been lots of publications with this object, um, but it's also an endearing little fellow. Um, not so little fellow, he's actually 34 centimeters. So again, over a foot high um, and uh, he's hollow. So if any of you have ever worked in ceramic, that would not be easy to accomplish. Plus the very high degree of naturalism. He looks like a baby, that's why we call him a baby. But we notice that his head is really similar to um, the Olmec colossal heads, right? So, you know, conjectures possibly representing a baby future leader who has these cap on his head to do the cranial deformation, right? So this is also something that kind of begins to, to bring together the different um, components of this culture that I've been showing you. So these caps on the head are possibly what they're using. We know they performed this since infants um, to be able to achieve that malleability of the skull. Um, and so possibly that's what we're looking at, right? Look at the shape of his head already, right? And it also has that sternness, but at the same time, it's so cute. He's kind of, you know, is he teething? You know, is he a teething baby? And he's just chewing on his knuckle to, to help his gums? No idea. Um, so this likely, and again, these are, this is elements, as I mentioned before, glyphs, possible glyphs, possible symbols that might have meaning that can be decoded someday by somebody. Um, you know, the Mayan glyphs were, were only really fully decoded until the 80s, so not even that long ago. Um, so we may find out. But what I wanted to point out is that it's really interesting that they also is, is um, images of people with certain um, deformities, which is really interesting because they're not represented in a way that makes us think that they're lesser in society as you know, historically uh, more European society has tried to like hide those elements. It's only in recent years that there's been major movements to, um, uh, toward accessibility um, of all kinds. But in this case, um, it's interesting that it's something that's actually, in a sense, venerated. And I, I'm only showing you one example, but there's tons of examples throughout Mesoamerica of figures with different kinds of de uh, um, 
kind of deformities. Um, this is one that I'm not sure exactly if that's it, but this is one from the collection of Dr. Bourgeois um, uh, objects that are in your universities. So I thought it was just exciting to consider. This is most likely something much later than the, well, not much later, but later than the Olmecs um, from a different region, also uh, more toward the West. But I just wanted to show you that, you know, you guys have something nearby that might be something along those lines. Um, and like I said, there's different cultures throughout, uh, different um, civilizations in the entire Mesoamerican region. One of them is a smaller grouping known as Tlatilco, which is closer to where Mexico City is. Later, I'll show you on the map, but imagine more towards the Northeast, right in the middle, but more toward the Northeast, um, the more Northwest, sorry, from where we were before. And these, what I wanted to show you more, most importantly, is that not everything pre-Columbian is stern. Um, a lot of times we think of pre-Hispanic art and it's very like serious and it's very stern, but there's a lot of really funky things as well. Um, this is a figurine of a woman with a double face. Um, so I linked it to potential, like maybe there was somebody who was born like this and they're registering it, or perhaps it represents something altogether different, which is a different way of a dual vision, which is what it's usually read as within, um, uh, among archeologists and, and art historians. So this actually represents a kind of dual vision where we're respectful for the human as well as nature, where we're interested in life as well as death. Um, so this kind of um, ability to see more widely and more openly, perhaps that is what this figure is representing, but we have no idea. There's no way of us for us to actually know. I wanted to show you a few other figurines that are also cute. We never think of, you know, really old objects as being cute and um, documenting everyday life, but here are these also from Tatil Tlatilco women with dogs. Dogs were very important in um, pre-Columbian culture, pre-Hispanic culture, um, and so it's interesting to see how dogs are represented um, throughout these in particular uh, draw my attention. Um, hey, Lauren, and can I, um, yeah. oh, sorry. Please, go ahead. No, please go ahead. No, just because we've got some good questions in the chat box again, and um, so Jordan was asking, is the baby that we were looking at earlier, um, is the baby wearing a cap or helmet of some sort? And I was wondering, is that the same type of helmet that the um, large Olmec heads were seen wearing? It, it probably, or the or perhaps it was like, what I'm, I'm not certain, it's not certain, but it seems likely that um, they had their own cap that was maybe designed specifically for them, but that the tradition of wearing a cap probably begins at this point of babyhood when they're beginning to do this cranial deformation because the, the skull is still very malleable, right? So since they're this age, they're probably wearing these caps and then probably it's a cap that's an identifying marker of that specific ruler later in life. And that possibly the, ch the style of the cap probably doesn't change for the ruler or possibly it does. We don't know because we don't know who these rulers are. We don't have anything to tell us, okay, this is so-and-so as we do for the Mayan ones, which we'll see um, further ahead. And yeah, the next question, mm -hmm. why is the body shaped like that on the, on the double face figure? Um, interesting question. It's seen throughout different parts. And actually I, I, I had it in here and then I took it out another kind of strange, uh, not strange body type, but it's just not, it's not what we're used to seeing the way that uh, the body is represented. I have a feeling it's mostly a matter of, of um, yeah, just tradition, right? How the body was formed with the material, the clay, you know, what they did and how they worked it. And then it just became part of the, the, the tradition that was continued because you see it, um, you see it throughout Mesoamerica, definitely, and in different areas, all of that kind of um, central area of Mexico, but um, you see it in different at different times historically and in different places, different locations. So I can't tell you exactly why, but um, but she is an interesting, she is interesting. This is one, another one that I wanted to take out because I just fell in love with her. Um, you know, from our 21st century, and I've never watched Harry Potter, but Harry Potter age, I see her as a sorceress, some kind of awesome sorceress figure. Um, 
I don't know what she represents. We don't even know where she's from. Again, she's from the bourgeois collection and possibly as you guys go forward in your work on documenting the collection or, or um, finishing and in it's uh, inventorying it and stuff, you may come across some more information. Um, work with specialists who might help you out, I don't know. But I just think she's fantastic. Um, again, not sure where she's from, possibly from Veracruz, which is the area where the Olmecs were, but she's most likely an object made thousand years later from the Olmecs. Um, but I like to see her also in profile. So notice how in looking here up front, you don't get a sense necessarily that she's kneeling. She seems more like she's standing. But then when you look at her in profile, it seems like she's kneeling, um, which is interesting. And you know, we don't, again, I can't tell you anything more about this figure other than um, I think she's super cool. And, um, <laughs> and, and it's just exciting to think that you have there in your collection, these objects about which so much can still be learned and interpreted. Um, so I'm jumping ahead in time now to Teotihuacan, um, which is something else that, you know, everybody should know about Teotihuacan. The re There's no reason that we don't know about Teotihuacan because Teotihuacan is right outside of Mexico City, which is a major city in the Americas. And it has the third largest pyramid in the world. Why don't we know about that? Why do we only know about the pyramids in Giza? Why do we don't know? But we heard about, you know, Latin America or the, you know, the pre-Columbian Indians having pyramids or whatever. But like, why is this not something that we all know about? Um, so what we're looking at here is what was known as the Avenue of the Dead, given that name by the Mexica, which is the name for the Aztecs. Um, because we don't know how they refer to themselves as. Again, a site where we have glyphs, but there's not been any deciphered text, so we don't know very much about the Teotihuacanos. Um, here you can see the map and you can see where Teotihuacan is. So where we were before, the Olmec region was down here. Um, same as Veracruz, where possibly the sorceress lady is from. I get a feeling that she's from this area. Um, and so Teotihuacan is right outside of Mexico City, right in the middle, um, where the Tlatilco figures are actually. The figurines of the dog, uh, the little dog and the double-faced women, they're from right outside of, right around this region as well. Um, so Teotihuacan, this is a major city center, was the large, um, the, it was one of the largest, at its time, the time of its apogee, um, it was one of the biggest cities in the world. Um, it spanned, the city surface spanned uh, approximately 21 square kilometers, which is probably about 16, 17 square, 16 square miles. Um, and it's really interesting because as opposed to the regions that we were looking at, the Olmecs and then further along with the Maya, that they had to adjust more to the terrain, which is a rugged terrain. Here it's more desert, so they were able to build on a, on a grid. So the city, it, here you can see a very small map of a uh, plan, I mean, of the city, and you see it's a grid and um, it was super organized and it was very, it seemed like very compartmentalized as well. So it was like the shoemakers lived here and the ceramicists lived here and you know, it, was, it was divided in such way. Um, it seems that the highest, the elite residences were around um, this area here. So this was the Grand Plaza. We are standing on the Pyramid of the Moon what we're looking at over here is the Pyramid of the Sun. And this avenue that was known as the Avenue of the Dead because they assumed the Mexica, assumed the Aztecs assumed that this had to be some sort of Acropolis. There's no evidence of it having anything to do with burial sites at all. Um, so we still call it that, but it's not uh, anything to do with the dead. And it around this area that we're looking at was where the major residences were, but there's no, What's interesting about the site of Teotihuacan is that there's no major palace area. There's nothing that identifies a cult. Uh, again, this um, as opposed to the Olmecs where they we have clear indication that there was this uh, cult following of a figure, a certain figure. Um, in this case, there's not. There's no evidence of having like a king or a, somebody that's being registered in art um, to you know remember them by. So there's nothing here. So we don't actually have a sense of how they were organized uh, um, as a society, um, but there was clearly a hierarchy because there's some places of residence that were nicer than others. So hierarchy is definitely evident. Um, and it is, a, it is a city that grew and had a huge influence in the entire region 
as far down as Guatemala. Um, they were made, they grew majorly with the trade of obsidian, which is a black stone. It, when you polish it, it's super, super, super shiny and um, was actually used as mirrors and also as uh, stones that were used to read the, 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 the cosmos. Um, so it was actually, if you, what they would do was uh, to reflect the, the night sky, they could register star spots, the spots of stars, and then see the configurations. And so they would use them as such. They were super important um, and highly prized objects that clearly made them a very wealthy city. Um, and there was a lot of immigration to Teotihuacan because we have found that not only were people subdivided in um, by specialties, but also by migration groups. So there would be like people that we know migrated from a certain place based on their bones and their dent. The, the, again, these are things that I don't dominate at all, but um, the, the study of the bones can tell where people might have been situated. And so there's people that were clearly situated farther away um, who a whole town or a whole group of people migrated into Teotihuacan. It became like the major city center. Like I said, it was one of the biggest cities um, at its time. Uh, interesting to show, this is where we were just standing. So this is the, the, the Pyramid of the Moon. And what's nice to point out, and so this isn't the best image, and I apologize for the quality of the image, but what I, it's, what I like is the angle, because you can really, it's, it's hard in photographs to give a sense entirely of how this pyramid aligns with the mountain behind, um, which is, you know, it, it, it's just, it's, kind of like the pyramid is a mini version of this massive mountain that in this big open valley region kind of rises up. And so it's almost like humanity is trying to emulate mother nature by creating something that's kind of as big, but nowhere nearly as, you know, mind bogglingly, fascinatingly massive as is a mountain, right? Um, so this is the Luna, the, the, the moon, and this is the pyramid of the sun, um, which aligns with the sun, the, set, the rising and the setting of the sun at a certain time during the year. Um, and we know that this was covered by, um, in, in very colorful murals. So originally it would have been covered uh, with, with murals, but what's also interesting is that they were able to use stone because stone was not highly available in the Olmec region. So their pyramids are just clay and, and dirt. But in this case, um, again, that means you have to carve the blocks if you're building in stone. And that requires an awful amount of mankind, man labor, hand labor. Um, ah, the, the, the Jomon figures, yeah, for sure. Um, how long do you think they shape children's heads? Because I think a baby, I think they keep shaping their heads for many, many, many years. Um, I'm not sure. You'd have to look that up. Can you go inside these periods with stone? There's, they don't have entry points. Um, there are, they have, found, you can go actually under them and they've been found like channels and, and there's entry points to arrive at spaces of offerings beneath the pyramid. Um, so that, and, and they have found um, that underneath the pyramid of the sun, there's a source of water as well. So there's a thought that maybe the choice of the site has something to do with, you know, obviously the importance of water and that there are objects that were submerged, objects of offering that were submerged into these deep chasms of abysses of water that just, you know, go down into nature, again, back into Mother Earth so that they were find, they found like these offerings in there, um, ritual offerings in the water that's underneath. But inside, it's just, it's solid. Um, unlike what we'll see with the Maya ones that have a little bit of passageways. Um, this is, so the, the, the Pyramid of the Sun, we know at least was covered in, in murals, colorful mur frescoes, painted frescoes, um, which is really interesting and important. And for any of you who are aware of the Mexican muralist movement, um, you know, Diego Rivera and Gabriel Orozco and um, uh, David Siqueiros, they, once muralism began right after the Mexican Revolution, they took as one of their sources of, of inspiration, these murals, the murals, because Teotihuacan is literally like, I think it's 
40 kilometers at most outside of Mexico City. So they would go and they'd study them and um, would note they're brightly colored, natural pigments. Um, and she's fantastic and I should be seeing the time. Um, we, oh, I should have been nearly done by now and it's already, okay. Um, it's okay because uh, we're doing questions while we're going through the lecture, so. Yeah, perfect. So we can just do it that way. Um, so she's known as, this figure is known as the great goddess, but we have no idea if she's a goddess. We have no idea if she represents a deity. We have no idea if she represents, she's either like the, the representation of a deity or of some sort of a shaman figure who's dressed in um, all of this regalia. And we know that the shamans and we know that the leaders dressed in this very elaborate um, costume for the rituals. Uh, so these are probably acolytes or people that accompany. So these are most likely definitely, these are definitely kind of shaman figures, um, you know, religious figures, but um, the, this figure in the middle, we don't know. So we still tend to call her the great goddess, um, which I like because she's fantastic, sorry. Uh, she's just, sorry, she's uh, very, she seems to, you know, sprout life. It looks like what's coming from her hands is water, but at the same time, it's more likely the representation of, or it could possibly be the representation of some sort of a sacrifice that's taking place of a bleeding of the hands sacrifice, which is something that we know that leaders underwent in, let's say in the Mayan culture. So um, possibly that's what's going on. These little glyphs, because that's what we assume they are. We assume that these figures are possibly speaking something or something is being said, but again, this hasn't been deciphered. Maybe in the future, we'll know what they're saying. And when we know what they're saying, we're gonna see that everything changes. Um, we'll see how that happened with the Mayas. As soon as we were able to decipher the code, our vision of what the, who the Maya were completely changed. Um, from this goddess figure she sprouts a tree and there's all these creatures that fly around it and like flowers and it's just, it's so vibrant. Um, uh, yes, I definitely agree. We love important and powerful women. <laughs> um, so, so this is a great goddess figure and beneath her, uh, this is a bad image. It's really hard to find an image how it looks like she's on the top and then there's this image on the bottom, which we're gonna look at right now, which is this one, which I also absolutely love. Um, because again, we don't know what it represents. There's so many things. If we had more time, I'd love to hear you guys talk about it and hear what you think is represented here. Um, uh, sometimes people are like some sort of a purgatory scene, you know, reading it through the lens of, of Judeo-Christian thinking perhaps. But, um, but in this case, we notice the importance of agriculture, right? There seems to be products that are being cultivated here by this figure. There's all sorts of other creatures that are flying and floating around. Um, the, figures that seem to be emanating from the insides of the earth. The insides of the earth contain water as well as what you know, kind of makes me think of a volcano, right? And if we think again about all the importance of mother earth and, and how you know humanity emerges from the earth, um, it all seems to make sense. And also if you guys ever come to Costa Rica in around May, um, which is when the dry season ends and it begins to rain, it just, it feels like this. It's just like everywhere. Like, so it makes me consider that, you know, these are all images that possibly are also documenting the changes that, you know, the seasonal changes that are so important to be acknowledging, right? That comes in line with observing the sun, observing the stars, observing the cycles of life. Um, all of those things are su super important. Um, now, around the same time as the Teotihuacanos are the Maya. People have probably heard of the Maya. The Maya are really, really important. Um, among the things that are the and known for their pyramids, like this pyramid here in Tikal, the Maya are in what's known as mostly the Yucatan Peninsula and down into Guatemala, Belize, and even some of Honduras. Um, so we're moving, you know, Mexico City and Teotihuacan are kind of more over here where my cursor is. Now we're over in this area where the Maya are. And one of the most fascinating, well, this is what I was talking about before about how the, the landscape does not permit to easily build on a grid. And also to understand how it is that these, these historic archeological sites were just lost in time. Um, they're images of, of 
adventurous people, usually Europeans who would come in the 19th century, these traveler artists who were going to these remote sites that had no, we had no way of getting them because they're lost in the jungle. And you can see how they're lost in the jungle. This is today where they've been, you know, restored. But if you were to see images of these sites in the 19th century, they're totally overgrown by the jungle and taken over, right? So um, we don't know what happened to the Maya and why they stopped being a full, full force around 900 of the common era. Um, but Tikal was one of the most uh, pop largest and most populous of the Mayan city states. The Mayan city-states were kind of like the Greek city-states where they were always battling each other and marrying each other and doing you know, business with each other. Um, and they share a lot of cultural traits, a lot of cultural traits. Um, among them is the glyphs, the written language. This is what the glyphs look like. And the glyphs, they're not, um, oftentimes people think of them more as, um, kind of almost like a mnemonic device because they don't, they're not, um, it, it's, it, they're images that help to remind of a notion. And so they're very pictographic in that sense. Um, they're the most developed hieroglyphic system in the region, in all of the Americas, in the Mayas. We've been able to, I mean, decipher it so closely that we can even detect the date, the actual day in which something happened because um, we've been able to assimilate the calendars. So um, we know the date of exactly when something happened. What was recorded were things like the achievements of leaders, the births and royal births of leaders, royal weddings, alliances between cities, military exploits and such. And what's interesting is they were writing this stuff all over the place on vessels, on walls, on books, on sculpture, this stuff, the writing appears everywhere. Um, which is really interesting because subsequent cultures did not necessarily do that. For example, the Aztecs had writing, but it was definitely not as prolifically used as the Maya. So the Maya have this thing about writing everything down. Everything has writing um, and tells us things. This is, I'm going back now to, to the site of Tikal, just so you can see, I just wanna do this quickly so you can just get a sense of how magnificent these places are. This is the North Acropolis. Um, the, the major, the height of, of, um, of Tikal happened over a thousand years after the beginnings of the construction of this Acropolis, because what you're seeing here are buildings that were built on top of previous buildings that began to be built as early as 500 before the Common Era, which was kind of around the time of the Olmecs, um, but toward the end of the Olmecs. And so this is the North Acropolis. We're looking at the North Acropolis. And then this is the site from the North Acropolis to the Grand Plaza with the big pyramid, which is the one I had shown you earlier. Um, this is the pyramid of Hasao Chan Kawil, um, who was one of the major leaders of the site of Tikal at the time. Tikal is one of the cities that has a direct relationship to Teotihuacan, which is interesting as well in terms of how these people are moving around and influencing each other. And um, what's nice is that Chan Kawil, whose name translates to Sky Rain, had his wife, um, given a nice big temple, of course, of less height, but a big, nice pyramid with a temple on top for her as well. And her name was Lady Lahan Unemo, um, which is translates to Lady 12 Baby Macaws. In case you don't know what a macaw looks like, that's a macaw who came to visit me in my house. Um, I don't live in the city in Costa Rica, I live out in the country. And this was our friendly macaw who came to visit. So she's called Lady 12 Baby Macaw. Um, and um, so these are funerary pyramids. Why, how do we know that? We've, I mean, these are, there are different rulers who are buried under these pyramids. And we also know they're funerary because they have nine levels. And Shibalba, which is the underworld, is arrived at through over nine levels. And so all funerary pyramids have nine levels. In Talud Taulero, which is this kind of architectural structure that is, um, you know, like that next year. Uh, this is another site, the site of Palenque, which was a site where they deciphered the Mayan glyphs in the 80s. Um, and what we're looking at is this is the pyramid that, she, um, that also has nine. It's the funerary, funerary py pyramid of Bacal, the great, who was like the biggest 
king at the time. And this is what we usually call the palace. I'm not gonna go in depth to, to the palace, but again, it's, what's really interesting is that it was always thought that this must have been a university center of sorts and that this had to be an astronomical observatory of sorts, this big um, tower here. But uh, it turns out that that's not the case at all. Um, once they deciphered the, the the glyphs, they were able to tell that what was inscribed, this is known as the temple of the inscriptions because when you go inside, it's just covered in inscriptions. And when they deciphered it, all it talked about were all of the military feats basically and all the great achievements of Pakal the Great. And we know that it's his funerary, um, we assumed, they assumed it was a funerary pyramid, it was known about nine levels, but it wasn't until 1948 that they were able to open it up and actually took four years to take out all the rubble that filled in the stairway that led down to his sarcophagus at the bottom of the pyramid. And this is the sarcophagus lid, um, which if you can see with the diagram, it's surrounded by different glyphs and different, these all are glyphs that tell the date, for example, and, and different um, uh, achievements. And uh, this is an image that is talks about the axis of life, the axis mundi, in that here he's going down into the underworld. Those remember those jaws of the jaguar that I talked about with the Olmecs. Here you see them again, um, and so this is some sort of a kind of underworld monster of sorts that's kind of consuming him and taking him down. And yet it's almost as if his soul or his spirit rises up into this sort of tree of life. Um, and what's really interesting, and, and this is just to, to point out, it was the use of a cross when the Spaniards came and dominated and took over and um, wasn't totally foreign, right? So we see how a cross is used there and is linked to some sort of a spiritual leader as well as a, as a political leader. Um, this is mask. I just wanted to show you how these, um, the different images I've shown you where they have ear spools, just so you can see what an ear spool looks like. Wouldn't want that in my ear, but today it's, you know, common practice um, among people to do those, if, you know, whatever it's called, I always forget the expandings, the expansions. Um, and this is, this was found under his sarcophagus, and it seems to be a portrait of him. And he's rather a handsome guy clearly following certain kind of standards. And you notice that he, he has an element that extends the nose so that you don't have the, the dent here, but rather it's like a straight line. That was an ornament that was used by leaders. Um, and it's, um, I just wanted to share the names of his parents. So he was called Sun Shield and his parents were called Lady White Quetzal and Lord Jaguar Yellow Parrot which I love the names, but I also think it's really important to just take a moment to think about if your leaders have these names, you're gonna venerate those objects as well. You're not gonna just be like, oh, how cute the Katsad or oh, how cute the Macaw, right? You're actually gonna think like, oh, they're part of an important ecosystem that I'm a part of as well. Um, uh, within the ecosystem of roles in life. Um, this is from a different uh, Maya site. This is Yaxilan. Um, and this we know again from the glyphs that have been deciphered is the wife, Lady Shock. And she's known as Lady Shock, who is the wife of Shield Jaguar, the, the Ahau or the ruler at that time in 681. Um, uh, no, sorry. We know that 681 is when he began his rule. Um, it's, we know that this event took place and was registered on October 28th, 709 of the Common Era. This is how closely we have united the calendars. We can read the dates. Um, and what she is doing is she's piercing her tongue with a thorn studded rope. So she's putting a rope through her tongue to draw blood, which is then being collected in this kind of recipient below that has pieces of paper that are meant to absorb the blood. Um, we don't know if, uh, you know, what much more than the necessity of sacrifice to satisfy the gods to keep the balance, to keep everything in line. Um, and of course, we might think that this is all very barbaric, but at the same time, I 
kind of like the idea of thinking that my rulers and leaders really have to prove themselves. <laughs> um, so it's just an interesting thought, right? Where this is a public or semi-public, or I'm not sure who, who was actually evidencing or witnessing this event. Um, and with that said, here we can, I just wanted to show you some details in case it wasn't gory enough. Um, imagine putting that through your tongue. Um, and just to show you also the, the high degree of detail in this work. So this is a lintel, sorry, I didn't mention this, which would have been on the ceiling of one of the temples. And it's building 20, what's known as building 23. It's a lintel, it's on the top. Um, and so the detail that we were looking at is just this tiny part, uh, one of these tiny parts over here. So it's just a, a small amount of, of that stone. And just, you know, you look at the degree of finish and detailing that is, that is achieved on these um, relief works in Yaxilan, which is, you know, something shared within the Maya world. This, this very minute detail, attention to detail. This is what happens to Lady Shok after she, you know, hallucinates from the burning of the blood-soaked sheets of paper. Um, she has this vision of a serpent out of whose, so this is a serpent that rises up Here's the, I don't know if you can tell that this is an eye and he opens up his jaws and out of the jaws of this creature sprouts a figure. We don't know if the figure is a deity. We don't know if the figure is Shield Jaguar, her husband. And there's some people who've actually uh, hypothesized that it is herself who is emerging from the, the mouth of the, the serpent. Um, we also don't know if this is a vision that she had alone or is this a vision that was supposedly had with others present who were also seeing this vision? Um, we don't know what these rituals were like and what actually happened. In, but I think what's the most important to document and record is, um, or to keep in mind is that this is a record, this records this, I mean, I, I can't imagine most leaders today doing things like putting a thorn studded rope through their tongue to make sure that there's balance of the earth for all of us because that's the thing it's it's the how a house and the leaders fault if there's drought for example if there's if there's difficulties around um if our if our city is struggling it's that person's fault basically because something has happened to upset the gods um Okay, uh, that's a, this, uh, the tree of life. Yep, right, the level of sacrifice. I would love to see that um, leader. So here you can see her um, looking up, right? And then the figure of, and, and this, is, this is the bowl that had the papers that this is a plume of smoke that had been burning. Um, and then this is that figure that emerges from the serpent's mouth. Uh, this is, from yet another site, Copan. Um, this is not an awesome, powerful woman. This is actually a man. He is the leader 18 rabbit. Um, these names were given based, most, most often the name of the leaders was given based on the calendar. So the calendar has um, pictographic elements to identify the days and you know the months. One of the things also that unites all of Mesoamerica is the use of two, uh, uh, double calendrical system where we have a calendar of 260 days and a calendar of 365 days. I mean, that's, they're just, they were also the first civilization, the Mayas, um, to use the, the number zero, to use zero in mathematics um, before the Europeans were. So it's really interesting to think, again, a highly civilized um, society here who, in the case of the Mayans, the, the height that they reached waned at one point, and yet the Mayans were still there. Mayans never went away. They're still Maya today. Um, so here we're seeing uh, the, dia, the the Lord 18 Rabbit, um, the Ahau of Copan at that time, on December 5th, 731, who is uh, both represented as the God of Maize. So again, I just wanted to point out the important of Maize, the important of agriculture, the important of the relationship of humanity with nature. Um, that that's, I mean, they're venerating corn. They're venerating, we treat our farmers terribly. We pay them very poorly, unless they're, you know, the major wheat 
or corn producers that get subsidies or whatever. Um, farmers, that's not a good way. We don't venerate those people who are producing food for us. This is something that we just take for granted. Um, and that has led to so many of the problems that we have in today's world, the, not, the lack of appreciation for, um, for food and for nature and for how we get access to that food. Um, so here he's represented as the deity himself, but also represented as an olmul, which is uh, kind of like an acolyte of the deity of the, the, the maize god. So he clearly was probably performing a ritual where he's dressed as the homul to render, um, to venerate the maize god, who he is also um, acting as. So I just wanted to kind of put these images together just to talk about, you know, vibrance and how much life there is. Um, and I'm just going to jump to the, the Aztecs quickly because I think that, if I'm not mistaken, I'm, I'm coming near, drawing near to the end. Um, this is uh, a figure known as Chico Mecoato, which was a deity. So there's many, many, there's a whole pantheon of gods among Mesoamericans. Um, this we assume is, uh, it's from the central highlands and it's from the period during the Mexica or the Aztecs uh, reign. So it can be Aztec as well. But what's interesting is that there have been found a ton of these figures all around, um, which was a different manifestation of the maize god. So there's, there were different maize gods and goddesses that represent the different phases of um, maize growth. The Chico, uh, Chico Mecoatl is also known as Seven Serpent, and she represents the stage of from when it sprouts to actually growing and, uh, you know, that growth process. That's what she represents. She's usually represented with this kind of square headdress, um, which is supposedly representation of a, of a kind of temple built of paper. Um, so these are supposedly different sheets of paper that she has surrounding her head. Um, and I wanted to show her in relation to the figure that is on the invite for this talk, because when I saw this image, it, they're just, they're highly related. We don't know if they're the same. I have no idea. Um, I don't know, I haven't studied the bourgeois collection, but I got just a brief look at some of the objects and I'm like, oh my gosh, look, it looks like Chico Mecoato. Um, and she was venerated, not necessarily, there's not big images of Chico Mecoato. Uh, so there's not massive, and I, I didn't bring other images like Koyal Shauki or other of the major goddesses that are in the big temples in the middle of, of Tenochtitlan, which was the city of the Aztecs. Um, but these have been found all like kind of all over the place. So they were probably of home use. Um, she was not necessarily a lesser goddess, but certainly a goddess that was super important because a lot of people had her around and they were venerating her and she is of that difficult time for the farmer, the ensuring it goes from sprout to a plant that produces. Um, so of course she's gonna be in all the homes of probably the farmers, why not? Um, if this is what we need to venerate and appreciate and care for, because then that might likely make me a better farmer when I go outside because I'm, I'm caring for this. I, I truly and fundamentally care about the, this process. Um, so, from the Aztecs, the Aztecs were the last grand civilization in Mesoamerica before the Spaniards came. Um, and they were extremely good artists of all sorts, as were so many of the different cultures in the Mesoamerican region. Um, to the point that, and I close with a couple of examples on what happened as soon as the Spaniards arrived. So or Cortes um, overtakes Tenochtitlan, which is the capital city of, of the Aztecs um, in 1521 and puts the capital of New Spain, the colony of, of, of New Spain, the, the viceroyalty, sorry, of, of New Spain in the exact same place. It's like, oh, this is a pretty fancy city because it was, it was extremely um, uh, clean it had ex excellent um, aqueduct system to bring water in and to take water out. Um, they had, which is, it was a beautiful, beautiful, well taken care of city. There's red documentation from the different soldiers that were like, this is like a heaven on earth city, especially if you think about medieval kind of raunchy cities that had all sorts of hygienic problems right after the plague and everything in Europe. They come to this beautiful city. And of course they're gonna keep the city. And so um, it's built right on top. 
And they just simply did that. They just built their temples right on top of the temples of where the, the indigenous population had them. They just plopped one right on top. Um, and it's really interesting uh, to see this very early work, which is one of the earliest works, religious works created after colonization. Um, it's a mass of St. Gregory. It represents a ma the mass of St. Gregory, but it's made of feathers. Um, so it's basically like a collage made of feathers. And um, you can see that there's a lot of very iridescent colors. That means it's coming from bird feathers from all over the place, including, you know, the very rare Quetzal feather that there's only two that have this very intense green color or um, the different blue colors, these radiating colors. It's, it's quite an impressive object that we're before. And what we is, what, what is it's attributed to, the commission is attributed to um, Diego de Alvarado Juanitzin, who was supposedly the nephew and son-in-law of Montezuma. Um, who had been the last Aztec uh, leader. And it was supposedly created as an offering for the Pope. In 1537, the Pope pronounced the Sublimus Deus, which was a bull, a papal bull, or a, a statement that said that, ah, yes, the Indians, they have souls, and therefore they're fully human. And as fully human, they cannot be enslaved, as opposed to Black people they do not have souls and they can be enslaved. But the indigenous people can be enslaved, it cannot be because they have souls. And therefore, because they have souls, they also, we must make them very important effort, effort to um, uh, convert them to Christianity, right? And this is an important job and, and it's such an important job that we're gonna send a ton of missionaries over to help this happen. Um, so it's, interesting to see how they would learn in such a short amount of time. We're talking about 1539. 1539 is 18 years later. By 18 years later, the artists and artisans of the Mexica, who were obviously such skilled artists and artisans, that they learned a whole entire other system of visual vocabulary. Um, remember how hard it is for us to read the system, the visual systems of this indigenous work. This was a completely foreign language, and yet they managed it quite well. Um, what were they probably looking at, considering this is very early in the colonial period, nobody's transporting big works of art to the Americas yet. Like this colonization is just starting to happen. Um, but they had a lot of prints. And so it's quite likely that they learned from, uh, from prints and most likely in the school of Pedro de Gante, who was a, a missionary who came over to help with the Christianizing of the population, but who specifically also dedicated himself to opening a school that would help uh, form artists. Um, so they probably worked with this. And just a final example of, of assimilation and very quick assimilation. Um, these are frescoes that were painted in, there's many frescoes painted murals in different ones of the, of the monasteries that were built around um, the Viceroyalty of New Spain. And, you know, it, again, we know it's painted by indigenous artists following um, and using in many cases in local uh, materials and in a sense, the local techniques, but definitely not the local style. Although integrating certain elements of the local style, like these kind of serpentine uh, kind of almost borders that can be seen in indigenous work. So it's really fascinating to find those little elements of indigenous culture coming forth, but at the same time, like the major importance, for example, you don't see in European Christian art that much, so much attention to the sun and the moon. You do in Latin American colonial art, a ton of sun and moon, um, among other examples. Why are they black and white? Because the, the models they have to learn from are black and white. Remember the color systems are completely different. Um, for example, there is no distinction between green and blue in Nahuatl. So, you know, jade, the color of jade, which ranges from green and blue is basically a single hue within, um, within the indigenous cultures of Mesoamerica. So again, color is gonna be something entirely different. Um, and what they had to work with are prints from Europe, which are in black and white. Um, 
And, you know, this wasn't enough to show how European it had become. Um, we have evidence of you know, perspectival lines, um, which again, you know, perspective was invented 140 years ago, linear perspective, scientific perspective, you know, and it traveled all the way to indigenous artists in Latin America who were adopting and adapting um, the systems of, of viewing and um, documenting the world around them. Uh, so I wanted to close with the, this quote, um, Boaventura eh, de Souza Santos has this concept of the ecology of knowledges that I wanted to share with you guys. Um, and there's a, a quote from, from his text that says, reads, the ecology of knowledges is an invitation to the promotion of non-relativistic dialogues among knowledges, granting equality of opportunities to the different kinds of knowledge engaged in ever broader epistemological disputes aimed both at maximizing their respective contributions to build a more democratic and just society and at decolonizing knowledge and power. When I read this, I think, for example, of us all coming to a table where everybody is allowed to speak, right? Where all worldviews are, are given equal weight and permission to speak and to influence decision-making. Um, as we teach and, and as we learn, I think we need to consider the effect, um, the effect that we want the expansion of knowledge to actually have. So an interesting example is a contemporary work of art made by Colombian artist, um, Colombian artist Quiroga, who works with stone that he extracts from the depths of, of the world. Um, but there's a whole notion about how the shamans in indigenous culture believe that, you know, they do their shamanic rituals to, when somebody is sick, to retrieve the sickness of them. And it is believed that the sickness is transferred into the soil. Um, therefore, you don't want to disrupt the soil because if you disrupt the earth, you're going to release all those sicknesses. And it's interesting because today mining provokes so much of the problems that we have, um, you know, the environmental problems that we have but um, you know, if you we know that poking into the soil isn't releasing sicknesses, we know that scientifically we know that. But why not just allow other forms of thought to kind of enable us to have different forms of action in our in our daily lives where we don't mess with the earth so much. Um, we don't have to explain it through being shamans, but we can learn from these different forms of thought. By broadening our discourse, um, we can include a multiplicity of perspectives, of worldviews, and may just happen that we head in the right direction to save um, humanity and human presence on our earth. So thank you very much. Um, Thanks for your attention. I close with the super sorceress lady and um, uh, feel free to be in touch with me at any point in time. I know I've gone way over time, um, but I'm more than happy to take any other questions or comments. Thank you so much, Lauren. That was great. It was so interesting. I don't want to speak on behalf of uh, some of our students and um, Victoria, who's a former student working with me on this um, collection, but it was so cool to see the connections between the works um, in the collection and then other more famous examples um, and see how we can kind of like start situating them. Um, so that was great, thank you. And yeah, I do wanna open it up to any last minute questions that folks have. Um, feel free to use the chat box or just start talking. <laughs> thank you, Stacy. I appreciate your comment, it's nice. And we'll probably take you up on that offer to contact you if we have any other questions as we start going through the rest of the collection as well. Absolutely. I'm definitely not a specialist. As I told you, I, I looked, I, I confirmed hunches with somebody who is a specialist um, mm -hmm. in pre Columbian um, who, you know, would able to detect it that much better. But, um, but yeah. I think our collection has the tiny figurines. The, I mean, there's some of those that have that pinched waist. There's a lot of other ones that I've kind of made some relationship or several other ones that I made certain relationships with. Um, but again, it would need, it requires a lot of work. 
um, to yeah. kind of decipher, but pinpoint exactly. Yeah, Victoria says right with the pinch. Yeah, with the pinch. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah, there's so many pieces. Like I said, there's like hundreds. So, oh, what is that called again? Um, there is the Tlatilco. The earliest ones are Tlatilco. Okay, I'll write it here, Tlatilco. Um, but I don't think yours are Tlatilco. I think they're probably later, but probably from that region, which was, uh, it's kind of, I think it's called, referred to as the central, either central Mexico, um, central highlands, I think maybe, around there. And then there's other images that are kind of from Veracruz that I didn't show. The Sorceress Lady, I think, is from Veracruz. Mm -hmm. um, I think, I'm not sure, but um, which is just north of the Maya and has a lot of Mayan influence. Okay, gotcha. So thank you so much, everybody. I appreciate it. Thank you. It. Thank you so much, Lauren. Um, and thank you for all your great questions and comments tonight. And thank you for attending tonight's lecture. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye, everybody. Have a great night. <laughs> Have a great night as well. <laughs>